I'd like to introduce the final speaker this afternoon. Jeffrey Kahane is a noted pianist and conductor, especially for his work with the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra. And he, as, as many of you know, he's stepping down from that organization after 20 years and has programmed a farewell season rich in ideas, many of them related to this event, uh, including the Lift Every Voice Festival in January. He's appeared as a guest conductor with many of the country's leading orchestras, including the Los Angeles Philharmonic, the San Francisco Symphony, and the New York Philharmonic. As a pianist, he won the Arthur Rubinstein Piano Master Competition in 1982. He's also collaborated with some of the world's great artists as both a pianist and a conductor, including Yo-Yo Ma, Daniel Hope, and John Kamori Parker. Khan's known for his brilliant and thoughtful programming and for his combination of musicality and intellectual engagement. He'll be speaking this afternoon on Beethoven and Kurt Weill in the Garden of Exile. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here, and thank you to Bob and Mike for this wonderful invitation, and to all of my colleagues. Um, <clears throat> a week or so ago, as I was contemplating this talk and trying to hammer it into shape, I had the thought that I wanted to actually change the title to How Do We Perform, or How Should We Perform the Troubled Present? And uh, it was not out of any desire to be glib, nor to subvert the intentions or aspirations of, the, of this wonderful symposium. Quite to the contrary, it came from my desire to underscore specifically that the two works that I'm going to talk about are intimately bound up for me with the very fabric of my daily life. I think, in a way, with all of our daily lives, <clears throat> and the ethical decisions that we face as performers, as scholars, as critics, and as listeners, and perhaps above all as citizens. In 2008, Senator Barack Obama <clears throat> reminded us in a speech on race relations of the famous lines, he actually slightly misquoted them from Faulkner's Requiem for a Nun, the past is not gone, it is not even past. Um, I am going to talk about music of the past, the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven and Kurt Weill's final musical slash opera, Lost in the Stars. But uh, I'm talking about them very much with respect to the way that they relate to our lives today. Uh, one might think that the Garden of Exile in my title referred to the city of Los Angeles since it is uh, was in a way a Garden of Eden for the many exiles, including my own mother who came here uh, in the first half of the 20th century. But the reference is actually to a very specific garden. Um, I'm wondering how many of you have not ever been to Daniel Liebeskin's Holocaust Museum in Berlin? How many have not been there? Well. Um, the museum is one of the most extraordinary buildings uh, in the world. And the heart of it is actually underground. You descend to a, a vast space that consists of three axes. One is the axis of the Holocaust, the other is the axis of exile, and the third is called the axis of continuity. And at the end of the axis of exile, there is a door and you usually reach that at the very end uh, after having visited the axis of the Holocaust, which is a devastating experience. <clears throat> and there's a glass door that leads out into the garden of exile, it's called, <clears throat> which you would think would bring a sense of release. Um, but on the glass it says that pregnant women and people with certain health problems should e exercise caution going out into the garden. And the reason is that it's an extremely disorienting place. It consists of 49 concrete stelae or, or columns. The only vegetation are, are Russian olive bushes on the top. 
And the only sense of relief or release you actually have is when you look up and see the sky. The ground is slanted so that you can never get your bearings. No matter which way you look or which way you walk, you feel out of balance um, and disoriented and possibly even a little bit ill. Um, and uh, Liebeskin said that he wanted this to reproduce the sensation that exiles had when they came, uh, when they left their homes in Europe and came to other countries. I, on a very personal note, have always had an awareness, a sense of being a child of exile, even though I was born here in Los Angeles and grew up in, in comfort on the west side of the city. So much so, uh, I didn't even realize to the, the extent to which that was the case until my wife, not very long ago, found uh, a second grade assignment that I had written. I was supposed to write something about my family, and I, I said in it, when we arrived from Germany, uh, and I talked about it as though I were there, even though it happened 16 years before <laughs> I was born. Um, I was mostly, however, sheltered from uh, awareness of the shadow of the Third Reich on my family's history of, of the effect of the Holocaust. Um, I, I knew bits and pieces of the story. It wasn't really until adulthood that a turning point came when one of my uncles found uh, in my grandmother's papers after her death a, a lengthy document in German on, typed on onion skin paper uh, called Notes from Buchenwald Concentration Camp that had been written by my grandfather, whom I never knew. He died the year I was born. And uh, this detailed um, very dispassionately but eloquently his experiences from the moment of uh, his arrest by the Gestapo on the morning after Kristallnacht until his release miraculously only some weeks later from Buchenwald. He had fortunately booked passage. This was uh, uh, early 39 when they got out. They got out on the very last boat that made it out of Hamburg Harbor uh, before the famous voyage of the damned. As I grew older, I began to think more about the implications of this story for my life as a musician. And I began to play and conduct and talk about works by Pavel Haas and Erwin Schulhoff, Gideon Klein and Viktor Ullmann. But uh, those composers, much as I love and cherish their music, don't figure into this talk today. I'm um, not really going to talk, in fact, about the Holocaust at all, except insofar as it is part of, for lack of a better word, the backstory here. Um, when Bob Elias approached me about speaking at the symposium, he graciously suggested that I might take the opportunity to talk about the Lift Every Voice project that we're doing with the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra in January. And I'm not going to do that except to mention that, that Tamara Levitz uh, referred to the symposium that's going to happen on uh, Kurt Weil and Joachim Prince, which is actually, uh, we are collaborating with the UCLA Center for Jewish Studies in presenting that symposium. Um, you might be, you would certainly be forgiven for thinking it's a bit of a stretch to talk about a Broadway show and the Ninth Symphony in the same breath. <clears throat> and in fact, Lost in the Stars and, and the Ninth Symphony are aesthetically pretty far apart. But there is a very powerful thread, in fact, that binds them together. Lost in the Stars, which was Weil's final work, written in 1949, just before his untimely death of a heart attack at the, uh, in 1950, he was 50 years old, is hardly representative of Broadway. It was not representative then, nor is it now. Um, it is a show full of beautiful and powerful music. Unlike South Pacific, which opened the same year and which also deals with issues of race and bigotry, uh, or West Side Story, which opened seven or eight years later, which similarly deals with those issues. Lost in the Stars is not a show that has a lot of memorable tunes, no glitzy dance numbers, uh, no opportunity for spectacular scenery. It is a rather stark piece, and um, Vile and his collaborator Maxwell Anderson, uh, I believe they actually spoke about it rather in terms of uh, imitating Greek tragedy in a way, and particularly the role of the chorus. Uh, 
for all um, that vile, for all intents and purposes, vile really shed his European and German identity when he came to this country. It is often said that there are two Kurt Weils. There's Kurt, there's Kurt Weil and Kurt Weil. Um, and, <clears throat> and that is true um, to, to a large degree. But it is important to remember that he came from the great German tradition. He studied in Berlin with Busoni, who briefly studied with Karl Reinecke, who briefly studied with Liszt, who studied with Czerny, who studied with Beethoven. So in that sense, Weil had an impeccable pedigree. He also said often throughout his career that his great model for everything that he did, his supreme model was Die Zauberflöte, the magic flute of Mozart. And he pointed out the fact that that was a piece that was written as a commercial venture. It was, it was for a popular theater, and yet it attained the highest musical standards. Um, from the Nazi's perspective, of course, uh, Weil's uh, pedigree as a Jew was also impeccable. And to make matters worse, um, he was an enfant terrible of the avant-garde. And there is little doubt that had he stayed, uh, he would likely have met the same fate that many of the composers we now refer to as the recovered voices met. But he. Uh, left Germany, he fled to Paris first in 1933-34 when he was working on his second symphony, which, which would be his final major instrumental work, and then came to America. And like my mother, he learned to speak flawless English, uh, practically without an accent as I understand, and he prided himself very much on being an American. Um, he was infuriated when Time magazine called him a German composer. Um, <clears throat> shortly after his arrival in America, Weil was invited by George Gershwin to the dress rehearsal of Porgy and Bess, after which he told a reporter, it is a great country where a work like that can be composed and performed. It wouldn't be long before Weil himself embarked on a Broadway career that would produce a series of path-breaking works, some of them, some of the greatest of all Broadway musicals, in many of which he succeeded in what the distinguished vial scholar Kim Kowalki called a sustained effort <clears throat> to create new hybrid forms of musical theater situated at various points along the continuum between spoken drama and traditional opera. Weil was a Broadway composer with a difference. He was not only schooled in the great classical tradition, but he also brought to his work a keen social conscience. He once said in an interview with Boris Goldovsky, I have always, something to the effect, I've always identified with people who are persecuted, people who were suffering, wherever my music expresses the suffering of persecuted people, for better or worse, it is true vile. It was perhaps precisely because of his newfound love for uh, his love for his newfound home that he was so appalled by the fact that African Americans were not accorded the same rights and privileges as white Americans were. And so, uh, in his final work, he and Maxwell Anderson chose to confront the issue of race relations head on by writing a musical slash opera a tragedy set in South Africa based on Alan Payton's novel, Cry the Beloved Country. It opened on Broadway in 1949 and ran for nearly 300 performances. Uh, the critical acclaim was, uh, for the most part, extraordinary, and on the rare occasions when the work has been revived, many critics have described it as among the most moving experiences in their lives in, uh, as, as music critics or theater critics. Briefly, the, pl the plot of Lost in the Stars centers around two families, one black, one white, one poor, one wealthy. Uh, the, the protagonist is a black Anglican priest named Stephen Kumalo, whose son Absalom has gone to Johannesburg to look for work and has not been heard from for over a year. The white his white counterpart is a plantation owner and, and staunch supporter of apartheid uh, named Arthur Jarvis, whose son Edward is an anti-apartheid lawyer who supports uh, Stephen Kumalo's church, much to his father's dismay. 
Stephen travels to Johannesburg. I'm collapsing the plot tremendously to discover that, that his son has been involved in a botched burglar, burglary and um, was carrying a gun that he, was, he didn't really want to be carried, uh, carrying. And when, uh, in the midst of the burglary, he and his partners were surprised, he accidentally shoots and kills the owner of the house, who turned out to be none other than Edward Jarvis, the son, uh, who was the, uh, the white uh, son who was the benefactor of his father's church. He is sentenced to death by hanging when Stephen Kumalo goes to the father and begs him to intercede uh, for, and uh, ask that Absalom be allowed to spend his life in prison rather than be hung. Arthur Jarvis refuses. Stephen goes back to his church and he tells his parish that he must resign and leave because he has not only lost his benefactor, but he has lost his faith. Uh, Arthur Jar Jarvis is standing outside and hears this and has a last minute conversion. And he goes and he tells Stephen Kumalo that he will become the benefactor of his church and actually invites um, Stephen's illegitimate grand nephew, I think it is, to play with his grandson, something he never would have thought of. And the, these two fathers who have each lost their sons are united in their grief and in a sense of hope. Uh, Kim Kowalke, uh, whom I quoted earlier, wrote, the audacity of producing on Broadway in 1949 an indictment of apartheid as a metaphor for the racial injustice of separate but equal segregation in the United States is perhaps best evinced by two related events cancellation of the national tour of Lost in the Stars uh, because the African-American cast could not stay in the same hotels as the white cast members. And the fact that only f that, that five years later, the breach of uh, African-American singers being uh, not allowed to sing at the Metro at Metropolitan Opera was finally broken. So in contrast, for example, to a show like Porgy and Bess, Lost in the Stars had confronted this very controversial, painful, and difficult socio-political issue head on. It would be very difficult to find a way for any performer or for any critic or scholar to invert or subvert or pervert the message of reconciliation between the races or the hope for brotherhood that closes Lost in the Stars. The same, I am sorry to say, cannot be said of the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven, about which it is not in the least hyperbolic to say that it is the most politically fraught work of music ever composed. The Uruguayan writer Eduardo Galeano in his book Mirrors, Stories of Almost Anyone, wrote about the Ninth Symphony. Bismarck proclaimed the Ninth an inspiration for the German race. Bakunin heard it as the music of anarchy. Engels declared it would be the hymn of humanity, and Lenin thought it more revolutionary than the Internationale. Von Karajan conducted it for the Nazis, and years later, he used it to consecrate the unity of free Europe. The Ninth accompanied Japanese kamikazes who died for their emperor, as well as the soldiers who gave their lives fighting against all emperors, empires. It was sung by those resisting the German Blitzkrieg who died for their, uh, sorry, and uh, it was allegedly hummed by Hitler himself, who in a rare attack of modesty said that Beethoven was the true Führer. To the strains of the Ninth, the Berlin Wall went up in 1961, and to the strains of the Ninth, it came down in 1989. Which brings me to the question that provoked my thought about this talk in the first place, which is how does a child of exile in whose life the shadow of the Nazis, the shadow of the Holocaust, is always somewhere lurking in the background, confront the fact when he conducts this work that he loves so much, that this, uh, this central work in the canon has been used in films to accompany acts of extreme violence, has been compared by one noted musicologist to rape, has been co-opted by some of the most evil forces ever unleashed by the human race. Is there something inherent in the music of the Ninth Symphony that incites people to acts of violence, as some would suggest? And more painfully, is there any 
genuine, intrinsic, moral, or ethical content in this work at all, as so many of us want to believe? Does it have any intrinsic meaning? These are questions, of course, that are tied up with philosophical debates that have gone on for a very long time about the nature of music and the nature of meaning. When Thomas Mann was writing his great novel, Dr. Faustus, which is kind of a metaphor for the decline and ultimate fall of uh, Germany, um, his protagonist, the composer Adrian Leverkuhn, writes a massive opus which is intended to be kind of a negation of everything that Mann thought the finale of the Ninth Symphony stood for, i.e. everything noble and good and hopeful. He kept a notebook in which he wrote about this. It is really a desire to escape from everything bourgeois, moderate, classical, sober, industrious, and dependable into a world of drunken release, a life of bold, Dionysiac genius, beyond society, indeed superhuman, above all subjectively, as experience and drunken intensification of the self, regardless of whether the world can go along with it. The bursting of social bonds is also political, intellectual, spiritual fascism, throwing off humane principle, recourse to violence, bloodlust, irrationalism, cruelty, denial of truth and justice, self-abandonment to the instincts. Is this starting to sound familiar? And unrestrained life, which is in fact death, and insofar as it slides the work of the devil. Fascism is a devil-given departure from bourgeois society that leads through these adventures of drunkenly intensive subjective feelings and super greatness to mental collapse and spiritual death. It is the energy of drunkenly intense <coughs> subjective feeling, these are my words now, to which I think Schiller refers in the words in his ode, Wir betreten Feuertrunken himmlische dein Heiligtum, we step drunk with fire, heavenly one, into your sacred realm. It is probably that drunkenly intense subjective feeling that makes possible the abuse of this music. Perhaps it is worth considering in this moment that the music of our nat national anthem, as I suspect most of, most of you know, was originally an 18th century English drinking song. One might be forgiven for wondering if out of control nationalistic fervor and a state of intoxication are linked with one another. To the list that I read before of all those different reactions to experiences, interpretations of the Ninth Symphony, that list from Eduardo Galeano, I want to add one more instance. Dylan Roof, the 21-year-old shooter who terrorized a community and murdered nine people at the historic Emanuel African Methodist Church in Charleston, South Carolina, on June 17th of last year, admitted to his crimes and later confessed that he committed the shooting in hopes of igniting a race war. He posted a photo on Facebook where he stood in a, stamp, a swamp glaring at the camera. And on his jacket were the flags of apartheid era South Africa and Rhodesia, two white supremacist regimes. I don't know and I really don't care whether Dylan Roof knew this or not, but in 1974, the Republic of Rhodesia adopted the Ode to Joy as its national anthem. Which leads me back to these excruciating questions about meaning and the misuse of this music. I can only give you a personal answer to these questions and a deeply personal one it is. Over the, ca uh, the course of this past summer, I reread a book that influenced me greatly the first time I read it and, and has had an even deeper impact on me the second time. It's not a well-known book. It's called The Deconstruction of Literature, Literature After 
Auschwitz by Professor David Hirsch, who was a professor of English literature and Judaic studies at Brown University. Hirsch's thesis, which he argues with the fervor of an Old Testament prophet, is that the dominant modes of literary criticism and literary theory since the end of the Second World War have either resulted in or sprung from a dehumanizing attitude towards language and have attacked, debased, and attempted to destroy the idea that words actually have meanings. Literary theorists, he says, are no longer concerned with such questions as what does a poem mean, or what is a particular poet or artist saying, or what makes a great work of art. Instead, they have turned their attention to such questions as what is meaning and what is language. Is meaning to be ex equated exclusively with differences within language systems? These questions, he continues, are not new, nor is the radically skeptical mindset that generates them. What is new is the insistence with which these questions have come to occupy the center of literary theoretical concerns. And later he says, in turning away from the urgent moral dilemmas posed by writers who bore witness to an ugly European past and in subjugating themselves to the ideational structures that had helped to create that past, literary theorists inevitably committed themselves to trivi trivializing not only literature, but life itself. And he finally says, there is no doctrine of human rights in the literature of deconstruction. Now let me say that I think his positions may be perhaps a little extreme, but I also think some of his points are very well taken. In Orwell's 1984, uh, there is a famous passage, which I'm sure you will all remember. It says, the ministry of truth, mini true in Newspeak, was startlingly different from any other object in sight. From where Winston stood, it was just possible to read, picked out on its white face, in elegant lettering, the three slogans of the party, war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. The Ninth Symphony is famous, the text for Schiller's words, alle Menschen werden Brüder. All people, not all men, will become brothers. It was originally in 1785 when, when Schiller first wrote the poem, uh, more, well over 20 years before uh, Beethoven wrote the Ninth Symphony and said it in a different version. That line was, Bettler werden Fürstenbrüder. Beggars will become the brothers of princes, which I think suggests that Schiller probably would have voted for Bernie Sanders if he were alive today. <laughs> um, and of course, that was, take, that was a little bit too hot for, for the climate of the time. But I do, in all seriousness, think it's worth pointing out that those words, alle Menschen, werden Brüder, that Beethoven eventually set, are an echo of those words that had been written down only less than a decade before Schiller wrote the first version of the Ode to Joy, which are, to be sure, among the most beautiful words in the English language. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Of course, we know that the Founding Fathers did not mean all people when they wrote all men, and yet somehow they managed to forge a document whose language left those who followed them not only the possibility but ultimately the obligation to make those words mean what they mean today, or at least what they're supposed to mean today. I doubt that a single one of them could have imagined that two centuries later, the United States of America would elect an African-American president or conceive of the possibility that a woman might succeed him. The fact that such events have come to pass is certainly cause for celebration. 
the fact that it has taken over two centuries for us to get there, the fact that within living memory, black Americans in many parts of this country lived in our own version of apartheid, the fact that de facto segregation remains a real and present thorn in the side of the body, body politics should remind those of us who have the good fortune to perform the troubled past that we have a sacred and solemn obligation to perform the troubled present. The entire vast arc of the Ninth Symphony points not just to Schiller's ode, not just to the words Alle Menschen werden Brüder, it points to one single word. If you think about the melody, well, I have a piano here. I guess I might as well use it. There is one note when, it, when we hear it for the first time, one note and only one. It is the F sharp, which is also the first note of the tune, which is a half note, at least until the very last bar of the theme. And it is that note and only that note which receives an emphasis. accent is repeated one, two, three, four, I think five, each time the theme comes back with additional instruments being layered on top of the original melody and beautiful counterpoint, but that note is always accented before we ever hear the word that it underlines. And when we finally do hear it, that one word is all, 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 all. If he were alive today, he would say, just what part of the word all don't you understand? <laughs> That's what I think anyway. There are some truths that must be considered self-evident, axiomatic, unquestionable, unchangeable. And in my opinion, the word all can never, ever mean some. Not in the context of the Declaration of Independence, not in the context of the Ninth Symphony, not anywhere, anytime, ever. So thank you. I'm sure all of you have questions, <laughs> uh, but uh, can we take a few? Comment on what's called the theory that's being put forth uh, regularly these days that writers, and I'll expand it to say artists who are part of the so-called privileged class are, should not be permitted to write about themes, characters, or people of color. Wow, um, you know, that's an incredibly, uh, actually strikes very close to home. Um, my son is a very uh, gifted composer. He's both a composer of, for lack of a better word, serious classical music, and he's, he's also a very serious and gifted songwriter. And he recently, his last album is called The Ambassador, and the heart of that album is a long song about Latasha Harlins, who was the young um, black teenager who was shot and killed by a, a, a Korean 
shopkeeper, um, and uh, it, it's one of the most excruciatingly painful episodes in recent in the recent modern history of Los Angeles. And um, I wish he were here to answer that question because he has had extraordinary conversations with African American um, people in in academia and elsewhere who have thanked him and, and who have been so touched by the song that he wrote. Um, it's called Empire Liquor Mart. And I guess the best thing I could say is that when I hear that song, I mean, this is, I'm very prejudiced and he is my son, but um, I guess I would say, I, I, I really hope that that's not true. The, that's my answer. That's the best answer I can give. That, that I think that would be a terrible shame. I understand where it's coming from, but I don't agree with that sentiment. Uh, I, I want to ask, well, just make a comment, too, that um, when you were talking about deconstruction, but you were also talking about the, the various uses, uses to which a, a product, a, a piece can be put, depending in whose hands it is. I was flashing back, as often happens, to a cocktail party in Marin County. <laughs> and uh, I was chatting with a guy, and, and he said to me, I'd never met him, he said, do you know this guy Derrida? And I said, well, yeah, I mean, I actually know him. So some of my students are studying with him. He's teaching at UC Irvine, you know. Yeah. And he said, well, you know, I'm a death penalty lawyer in Texas. And I just used a bunch of arguments from Derrida to get an African-American guy off of death row. And I thought, well, you know, maybe there's something to, you know, using language in different ways that that's not entirely a perversion and i'm thinking also of clarence darrow and the whole you know sort of using the equivalent of deconstruction to defeat the william jennings bryan as as we often see when the, when it's performed as a play or even read about it uh, so it's just um it's it seems like deconstruction like beethoven's ninth uh can be used differently in the hands of many I, I absolutely agree. That's why I, I made a point of saying that I, I do think his position is a little bit extreme, and I don't agree with everything he says, but I, I think at the, at the heart of his argument is a very potent indictment of, of the, the fact of the debasement of language and the idea that truth is somehow mutable when it comes to very important fundamental human values, and that's where I think we... I mean, all you have to do is, you know, look at the news, which I try not to do these days. <laughs> uh, I think we have time for one more. Do I see any hands up raised? Yes, please, Lily. I had a question about your use of the word exile. Um, I know I've read uh, some from other emigres who don't like that term, that it implies that the present is not home and that there would be a return. And for many of them, the return would actually be, or the exile would be going back to Germany. How do you, how, uh, what do you feel about that term? What does your family think of that term? Um, well, I chose it specifically because of its use at the Holocaust Museum and the experience, which I know that many emigres, uh, whether we call them exiles or emigres, had of this kind of sense of disorientation. Um, and it is a very powerful, when you, if, if you go to the museum and you experience that, it's, it's, it's unbelievable how, how quickly you get this, this feeling of disorientation. Um, I have, uh, I will just say personally that I am the child of an emigre and I also feel a sense of exile because for me, uh, when I have had the opportunity to go back to Germany, which for a long time I had no desire to do or I found it terrifying. And interestingly, I've had some of the most powerful and beautiful moving experiences as a musician going back. I'll just very quickly in conclusion say that I had the opportunity uh, three or four years ago to conduct the Second Symphony of Kurt Weill in Hamburg, just a few miles from the harbor where my mother had sailed 70 years before. And for me, it did feel like a homecoming. And I spoke to the audience about, uh, about the significance of that. And by the way, I don't, as far as anyone there knew, they had never heard the seventh, Second Symphony of Kurt Weill, which was incredible, which is a, it's an amazing piece. So um, 
I don't know. I don't have a, a, a simple answer to that question, except I think that I feel both words, at least in my experience with respect to my family, I think both apply. Thank you very much. That's all for this session.